So as we uh, reach the end of day one of the Centre Court MBA Festival that has taken us from Barcelona and Regent's Park in London <clears throat> to both uh, East and West Coasts, um, it's a special treat for me uh, to host this final session uh, with someone that I cherish dearly in the industry uh, from Columbia Business School. It's lovely to have Michael Robinson, uh, the Senior Director of MBA Admissions, and joining him uh, and a friend of Centre Court, uh, Trisha Bioni, who has done these uh, uh, events before with uh, with John Byrne. I promised her that I was a soft touch. Uh, Tricia, of course, is the Executive Director of Career Education and Advising uh, at the school. Uh, New York never stops reinventing itself, and, and I'm sure that's equally true for Columbia Business School. Now you have this extraordinary new campus at last at Manhattanville. Uh, so perhaps, Michael, just starting with you, um, tell us from you know your perspective, your years of, 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 at the school, um, a little bit about Columbia, you know, it's it's missions, uh, it's value, obviously, uh, it's values, obviously the location, uh, and just what makes it such a, a magical institution. Yeah, so we're one of the older and more storied MBA programs. So we actually started in 1916. And I want to kind of start from the beginning, because in that class of 61 students, eight of them were women. Um, and just to put that in historical context, Women didn't start attending HBS until 1963, almost right. 50 years later. So we have this long and proud history of doing things a little bit different, differently and of being a bit more forward than many of our peers and so on. Um, we have two primary intakes. Um, we have a class that starts in January, accelerated program. You do the green 16 months. That class is about 200 students. Um, the majority of our applications is interest. Um, we, we do see people apply for our fall program where we'll have about 650 students. And as you said about the, the two new buildings, I've been at Columbia for 20 years and no one has come into Eurus Hall and said, oh my God, that is the most amazing building I've ever been inside. No one has ever said, that, right? But now it, it's, it, it's, it's a different feeling where, where, when people walk into the new spaces and it's really transparent. You can literally um, see from one side of the building and see all the way to the, literally through the glass, the, 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 the windows are from the floor to the ceiling and so on. So it's, it's really transparent. So there's this new kind of openness that's really, really, really exciting. Um, you asked about mission, right? So if you go to the website, you will see language that, that speaks about our commitment to developing leaders who, build enterprise that create value for stakeholders and society at large. But um, I'll speak a bit simpler um, because I'm also very proud along, uh, along with Trisha as well. And when I think of the people who start our program, um, they're driven, they're collaborative, um, they contribute. In, in, in ways that are meaningful. So the, the, the people want to be impactful. So over 20, in, in the 20 years that I've been there, while the areas of focus and the areas of interest that changes over time, this it's the same kind of person, you know, the same kind of person that that um, is helpful to, to their classmates, helpful to other alums and so on, and helpful to the community as well. They're great team players. I, I guess, uh, Tricia, you then have the excitement of them you know, joining the program after Michael and other colleagues have sifted through so many thousands of uh, very talented and purposeful applications. Uh, and, and now with this uh, image that uh, Michael paints of, you know, the extended horizons, the transparency, you can you know, you see even further to the other end of the building with this. Um, I suppose the, the Columbia class of uh, 2022, uh, you know, just coming out onto the market after two uh, very challenging and uncertain years. Um, do you see those sort of vibrant characteristics, the, 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 the agility, the determination that's going to serve them so well in the next steps of their career? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Michael really hit the nail on the head when he talks about the type of student who is attracted to Columbia Business School. Um, they're also attracted to employers for that reason. Um, just that tenacity, that roll up the sleeves, get the job done while being a collegial team player on the job. You know, um, I started my MBA at Columbia 15 years ago, and you know, a lot has changed in terms of employment over the last 15 years, just 
what macro dynamics are, but what hasn't changed is the success of Columbia Business School in their landing um, post-graduation and how successful they are, um, not only for that first MBA job, but really thinking three years, five years, 10 years beyond, because the value of, of the Columbia MBA isn't just that first job post-graduation, it's where is it going to take you and how is it gonna evolve throughout your career? So I absolutely see you know, exactly what Michael was talking about in what makes someone attracted to Columbia in, in being a community um, minded person. That's, that's what makes them really successful in the job market as well. Well, of course, your Zoom title has that badge of honor of the class of 2009. When yes. you applied to the school, very different from you know the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis that that then led to. I, I suppose just speaking to that point and, and not just being about the first job after graduation, is it this sense, whatever the economic cycles, you know, the ups and downs that we will see, you know, again, the, the, the challenges of the last two years, that you're always, always going to be better off with a Columbia MBA than without? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, even just thinking about my class, you know, the, the fact that we were very successfully employed post-graduation, despite the worst economic uh, situation, um, that spoke to the power. You mentioned Lehman Brothers. Columbia Business School was the only business school that had 100% of its Lehman Brother interns absorbed by Barclays. No other school was able to say that, but Barclay honored the full-time offers to every single Lehman intern. But really fast forward, out of my class um, came little known companies like Daily Harvest and Betterment. Those were both founded by 2009 grads because when there are difficult times, it does create opportunity. But this actually hasn't, even though the pandemic was challenging for everybody on an emotional point of view and on a physical for sure point of view, at the same time, the market has been very robust over these last few years. And so our students have actually had a wealth of opportunity and, and multiple things to choose from. So, you know, as much anxiety was, was among students broadly across all MBA programs about, well, what is the uh, market going to look like for MBA talent? The reality was, was that it was so robust. It really wasn't the same as when I was a student graduating 0809. Do you, that just, think just, just, oh, can I just j jump in and, and, and say something since we're kind of like talking about like just like tenure and, and experiencing um, folks over time. Um, so F Fortune just came out with their Fortune 500 list um, last week, right? And there, there's a young man, well, so the young, young man to me, um, Got him, Robert Rifkin, who is now one of only six African American CEOs of a Fortune 500 company, but he's the only founder, like like started a company to base the only founder on that list in the history of the Fortune 500, right? Um, and like you knew him as a young student 20 years ago, and and so on. So he's literally on like three separate lists, right? Like. Um, there's a list of like the five most insp inspirational people, you know, the list of the, the top 10 youngest people who are for Fortune 500 leaders. And, and the cool things like, like you can text them and say like, congratulations, you know, so, so you, you still have this long-term relationship with, with people um, going back. And, and it's amazing from the admissions point of view where you, you see this young person at the beginning and, and you, you see the potential there and then you actually see it realized over time. It, it's, it's a feeling that gives us tremendous pride. I, I can imagine. And with two decades of that experience, Michael, uh, it's, are there still the same fundamentals as you look at uh, an admissions file this year compared to 19 or 20 years ago in an individual, you know, that's had such extraordinary and inspirational success? Is, is it sort of behaviors? Is it, is it patterns that you can see or sort of ah, something special about this individual? We don't know quite what he or she is going to achieve, but we think that with the Columbia MBA experience, it's just going to open doors. Yeah, so, so I, I wish I had this magic crystal ball, but I don't. But 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 having said that, though, there, there are a couple of fact patterns. Though, right? So so one um, beyond grades and test scores, there's real examples and evidence of intellectual curiosity. Right. So that, that, that these people like to learn, which is not the same thing as getting straight A's or the best test scores. Right. So so they 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 like to learn, and and then the other thing, right, is there's like 
a high level of emotional intelligence and EQ and so on, where they just have an ability to, to get people to believe in the vision and, and they, they know how to execute, right? So you're looking for that person who's typically 26 to, to, to 30, and you're trying to find real examples of, of one, how they're able to basically help drive results for it for a team. And, and you try to kind of project that out 10, 15 years out and so on. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's hard, right? But, but the thing though, is that like we have proof points, real evidence, looking back at the resume where you see real growth over time. Um, and you read the, the, the recommendations really carefully and, and you really get a sense of, okay, well, this is why I expect this person to do really, really well, really well in the future because they have done it, right? So, so they have outperformed their, their peers um, but in, in a way that still is team focused, right? So they, they do well, but, but it's not the kind of person that says like, my success depends on me making you fail and me sabotaging you to basically get ahead because that, that's not the Columbia way. Right. Michael and his colleagues, Tricia, have um, reviewed somewhere between 120 and 140,000 applications in, in those uh, 20 years. Uh, and then they arrive with you and your colleagues in the careers team. Uh, and maybe they'd shared you know, their post-MBA career aspirations, but, but the real work begins. Is it that sense, whatever they had shared in the application, you know, that this is an opportunity to explore uh, adventure, new opportunities, new horizons? So how do you then approach you know, those, those first months of the program to really get them thinking about uh, a sense of purpose with their career? Yeah, uh, well, we start with why. It's the Simon Sinek concept. And for anybody who's not seen the TED Talk of Simon Sinek, phenomenal, highly recommended. But we start with why. Why the MBA? Why now? Why have you put your career on hold? And what are you looking to do with it? And it's not just, as I go back to the, my earlier point, it's not just about the first job post-MBA. It's where do you want to be in three years, five years, 10 years? When you start with why and you understand where are you going, then we build on that in terms of let's talk about the tactical. But that, that starting with why is so essential because the, in the same way that students have to answer that question, why Columbia Business School, why now for their application, they're going to have to answer for a recruiter, why product management, why consulting, why private equity, they're going to have to answer that question in a sophisticated way. And so we really start with that understanding of, well, why do you want to do product management? And what have you done before? And how do we connect the dots? And now let's talk about what your path there is, but not just a linear path. Let's talk about parallel paths because there might be two or three ways to get to where you want to go. You may need a half step vis-a-vis -vis an internship, or perhaps you are an opera singer. We have a phenomenal opera singer this year. You're an opera singer who has now decided to transition into the business world and you're really passionate about media and entertainment, well, you can go direct into industry on the business side, or maybe you can go to a tech company that also has media, or maybe you can go consulting and focus on media clients. There's lots of ways you can go to get to where you ultimately wanna go. So let's have that conversation. And you know, Matt, one thing that Columbia does that is unique versus uh, many of our peer schools is we have this conversation starting two months pre-matriculation. So we will assign all our incoming students with a welcome advisor and they have one welcome advising appointment two months before they arrive to have the conversation about why so that they can then spend the summer being really thoughtful about various career paths. We equip them with a lot of online resources around different things to think about. So by the time they arrive for orientation, they've not only ruled in things, but to me, more importantly, they've ruled out paths so that they don't spend their time on things that don't align with their interests, their skills, their values, where they wanna go, what links to their why. And they can focus on those three, maybe four areas that can get them where they're going and they don't waste time with all the noise with the things that are not right for them. Yeah. And, and I, I really want to build on that because I think the same advice that, that Trisha just shared is really relevant for the application process as well. And like I'm familiar with, with Simon Sinek as well, right? And it, it's the, the why piece is so important, right? But but sometimes people hear that and they think it's just one why. It's like it's not one why. So so the first response to the first why question that answer is very superficial. It's like well why probe and and then the second one is a little bit deeper. But you really get to the meat after the fourth or fifth why. 
Um, and that's where we want people to, to get to. So the, the key thing is real diligence, um, real thoughtful reflection and introspection and so on. And you're trying to figure out like, what's the best version of me as a leader going forward and so on. And they're really exploring the, themselves, really looking inward and so on, and then start looking outward to kind of like, um, given, given that you might want to do this, but then, but that skill set and that approach could also apply here as well. So that parallel path is like so important and critical. As, as one of the world's top business schools, Michael, obviously highly selective, um, and therefore some applicants that approach um, the whole process with perhaps a degree of uh, apprehension, and yet it's a gift, you know, to, to really be able to think deeply, as you say, the fourth or the fifth level of, of why mm -hmm. and, and what that will then uh, expose. As you think about your efforts and those uh, eight women in the class of 2016, the pioneers, um, and the continued efforts around diversity, I mean, you very generously uh, arranged your schedule to be able to join us at Centre Court from a consortium uh, event. Um, there are many traditional feeder industries, companies, you know, with uh, sort of um, generations that are applying to business school, perhaps they've had it in the back of your minds. How do you then explore the why with individuals, perhaps where business school, the, the opera singer that, that Trisha mentioned, yeah. and just this exploration, could the MBA make sense to me? How do you like to encourage them to think about this whole process and, and the investment that would be involved? So, I'm, I'm, I want to say something, maybe going off script and so on, but, but why not? Because that's, that's what I do. Um, a few weeks ago, I was listening to a, um, a conversation. Um, Henry Kravis, pioneer in the private equity space, was, was speaking. And I've heard him speak several times at Columbia. He often will say, like, I didn't have the best grades, the best test scores, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he actually expressed concern that like, I'm not sure I could get a job right now at my own company because I'm not fitting the, the, the profile. So, so he's pushing his, his firm to like, look at other things, right? Um, so one of the things about, even when I think about my past, I worked in the music business for a long time. Um, and I worked with people who were like super driven, super ambitious, but never really had access to the kind of top flight educational opportunity, right? So, so to me, the, the process has to be, right? You're looking at deltas, right? So, so what has a person been able to do with the resources given, right? Um, as opposed to just looking at, 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 at the, 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 the end state, right? Because so, so that, that's kind of key. And then giving everyone a real chance, right? So, so that opera singer, or the person in the military, or, or, or the person who didn't go to an elite school and so on, they have real talent, right? So, so talent is broadly distributed, but access to opportunity is not, right? Um, and, and then one of the things that I don't know, Tricia will, will share stuff, but, but um, so I almost got to Columbia the hard way, right? <laughs> you know, so, 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 so we weren't always like picked first. So, so, so there, there, there's a thing about like seeing the value and sometimes when that person that you're talking to doesn't see the, the value in themselves, right? And, and I think that that's our job. So, so that's, I think, my job in admissions to give people a real shot, you know, as opposed to like, oh, well, they had every single opportunity almost like handed to them. And some of those folks would be fantastic people, but I'm saying also leave space for people who didn't have ev everything, didn't do everything right according to what the profile is and so on. And then that makes for the best class, the most diverse class, and that's where real learning takes place. So, so the last thing I'll see on that point though, is also trying to find like, um, if that person is, is different or has di different background, will that person be brave enough, courageous enough to share that perspective in the, in the classroom, despite being the odd man or uh, odd woman out in, in the class. And, and that's something else that I look for as well, because when they do that, they teach their classmates so much. Yeah, you, you bring joy to my life when you go off script, Michael, don't, don't change. Um, uh, Tricia, you, I mean, we can talk about the hard skills, of course, the core curriculum that will provide, uh, you know, across finance and marketing, corporate strategy, you know, so many different aspects. As, as you think about the journey that you're then offering, I often feel that career services is this 
um, you know, underestimated in terms of the immense worth that you're then providing uh, these you know, young professionals to really think deeply uh, about that sense of purpose, the why that you emphasized uh, earlier. Um, to, to talk us through, I mean, are there intangibles, self-confidence, revealing uh, skills that perhaps they never uh, imagined that they have that, that you then see slowly emerging in that first year and of course on into the second year and many, many years beyond? Yeah, you know, some of it is is confidence. I, I have found, so I've been um, in the Career Management Center for 11 years and, and leading the team in my current position for seven. And, and what I have found now working with close to 10,000 students is that they come in very anxious, um, wondering if they made the right decision, wondering if it's all gonna work out and, and you see that insecurity. They don't show it to the employers. They, they show it behind closed doors in their one-on-one -on -one career advising appointments. But there's a lot of anxiety. There is um, a, an imposter syndrome that a lot of MBA students, irrespective of Columbia Business School, a lot of MBA students feel that. I still jokingly will say to the admissions team, I don't know how you let me in. I was 10 years as a journalist and you let me in, but you let me in. Um, you know, but what I see is in their evolution is as they go through the process of recruiting on whichever industry and timeline is, is most appropriate for what their goals are, they end up, they have a successful summer and they come back into second year with so much more confidence that anxiety, that uncertainty really goes away. And I think that the place that I most notice it is with our uh, CMC fellows. These are is a high profile second year leadership initiative where about 70 students uh, apply or interviewed and selected by the Career Management Center to be peer to peer career advisors during their second year. They are hired by the university for this role. And when, when they apply in the spring of their uh, first year, they all say, I don't know what advice I'm gonna offer. And they come in very nervous to their training. And then the first years arrive, all kinds of anxious and uncertain in the, in the new second years, the CMC fellows, all of a sudden they realize for the first time, wow, I, I know this, I've learned something, I've grown, I have something to offer, I'm paying it forward, I'm doing what my peers last year did for me. And that is that brings me so much joy to see that growth and see their recognition of that growth. I suppose in a similar way, Michael, you know, they could share in the application the the, the multitude of choices among. Is is it more than in the beyond classroom experience? You know, you offer so many clubs. There are so many activities. There's there's New York <laughs> outside mm -hmm. the door. How do those aspects of both the program and the wider community, then also feed into, you know, the sort of personal growth and development that Trisha is describing. So, what, one of the things as part of the diligence, right, is is that like I always encourage people to 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 find your tribe or find the, the ecosystem that you're going to work with most. Um, in your MBA program, right? So if your focus is sustainability, which is a big project for us as, as a school, then, then what's happening at the Green Business Club and so on? What conferences do, do, do they have and so on? So, so like, so I, I, I want people to almost like treat the application process as, as, as a, an immersive experience where you're really trying to get a sense of, okay, well, if, I, if I'm here for two years, if I'm gonna maximize the, the experience, these are the clubs I'm going to be involved in the, the, from a social perspective, from a professional perspective, and so on. So, so business school is not is not cheap. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's a big in, in investment, right? So to get the ROI that you need to get, right? What needs to happen? What do you need to extract from a value perspective? But then the thing I want people to also think about is where am I going to contribute? Where are my classmates going to learn most from me? And that's where the 80 or 90 clubs kind of come in and say, okay, well, I have these relationships in, in retail and so on. So I'm gonna help run the retail company. You know, so, so the, the, they're thinking about that experience. Um, and I want them thinking about that in the application process. So they kind of like plug and play. Now, now, now they kind of come in with, with a plan, but then by orientation, that plan goes out the window because they, they, they join 
five times as many clubs and then, then they kind of figure out okay well what do i need to do to to get my class um, pass my classes and all that kind of stuff and get the job i want so learning how to say no is also a critical skill like where do i prioritize um you know where do i make my real impact but but that's part of the the, the process as well you had arrived into the program trisha with your journalist background and, and you know, the, the quant skills that you also then needed uh, you know, to get through that, that core curriculum. There's often a lot of focus on that first job out of the MBA, you know, that, that, that sort of first immediate career step. As you then step back from that and look at the work that you're doing with students, I mean, you, you said earlier that they're thinking five years, 10 years down the road. So how, again, in terms of skills, perspectives, um, are, are you really putting in place the sort of building blocks that will continue to contribute to their career steps, uh, you know, in five, 10, 15 years beyond the program? Yeah, well, you know, Michael touched on it when he was talking about a lot of the community. One of the things about careers is it's not in isolation. Uh, there are three gears that make this experience work. It's academics, careers, and community. And they all are enhanced by each other, as, as Michael was saying. And so careers, it's a team sport. It's what they're learning in the classroom from their professors um, from industry. It's what they're learning in the community aspect with their club involvement, professional affinity or otherwise. It's also what they're learning through in semester internships, uh, which we see a lot of our students, particularly in the second year, will take advantage of being in New York and, and having that opportunity to have mini internships and mini experiences so that when they graduate, they're making the most informed decision about the best career for them. Because you're right, that, that first job is a very important thing. And so you, you want to make sure that you're going into it mindfully. And you also want to make sure that it's setting you up for success. And so part of my job is ensuring that the students understand that it is an entire ecosystem of career support around academics, careers, community and to maximize their value on the job, they need to be taking advantage of all of it. So for that reason, there is a lot of coordination among our office, Office of Student Affairs, the, the various centers and programs throughout the school and, and with the various faculty departments as well to ensure that in some ways we're all talking from the same playbook, we're all learning from each other, the faculty understand what current market dynamics are, we understand what current elective offerings are so that there can be really a 360 advising perspective for students. Now that mindfulness starts today. Here we are uh, beginning the summer. Um, perhaps uh, Michael with the team, you're still putting finishing touches to the J term that will begin in, uh, in, in January. Um, there are a couple of specifics uh, to Columbia's admissions process and, and maybe just talking uh, our viewers through um, not just sort of expectations, but a calendar because you work with rolling admissions mm -hmm. um, and there's the option of, of early decision as well. Could take us through that and perhaps you know, just how candidates can get to know the school in the coming months you know, to really get that sense of affinity and alignment with what you've described of, of Columbia. Yes, so, so um, I've been out of the office for, for, for a few days, but when, when, when I had left, um, we, we were figuring out how to bring more people back to campus because we, we still have some COVID restrictions, but we have re resumed campus visits and class visits and so on. So we're, we're going to make this much, more, much more robust in the, in the coming months. We still are going to do a lot of virtual programming as, as well. So the new application should be up very soon, right? Um, so, so by mid June, that's up, right? The, the, the deadline, to apply either for early decision or for the, the what we call the J term is always going to be within in, in early October, right? So, so you you have that that piece, um, and and then there's a, another deadline for those who are applying for the, the the fall term that that's key, which is the the fellowship merit fellowship deadline, and that's going to be within the first ten days of, of January. Um, most people do not apply early decision at Columbia. Right. But what I've found, though, is that the people who are most enthusiastic about Columbia tend to apply early decision. Um, 
And we found, we found that many of them tend to become the leaders on, on campus. So, so that paid forward that Trisha spoke about before, we see a lot of that within the early decision candidates as, as well. Um, so again, they're gonna be a mix of in-person events, uh, lots of virtual events going forward. We are hitting the, the road as well. So watch our website for, for that. Um, and then the, the, the thing I'd also recommend as well is try to attend as many of the professional conferences that are public that you can go to because that, that's a way to kind of get a real sense of, okay, well, if my focus is this, then this professional conference put on by these students gives you a real chance to, 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 to experience what the students can actually do because that's going to be the ecosystem that's going to be most important for your own career goals. Right. Uh, Tricia, my final question for you both as an alum of the program, and obviously with your work, <clears throat> that one magical aspect of Columbia Business School that, you know, thrills your day, uh, or it, it just makes the difference in, in, in your work and relationship with the school, what, what would that be for you? Oh my gosh, nailing it down to one. It's the community. <laughs> it's, it's the community. It's the network. It's the community. You know, my, my best friends are some of my cluster mates that I met on not only at the first day of orientation, but I met them at, you know, the connect event with this, the school cell day prior to, to orientation. And then we ended up in the same cluster homeroom. Those are still some of my best friends. It's the network that comes through, um, always willing to to meet a student, to uh, have a coffee chat, have an informational, share share their knowledge, pay it forward. You know, one industry that only a decade ago couldn't really spell MBA um, was retail and luxury goods. And yet they, we have so many alumni in such strong positions and they all wanna pay it forward. They all wanna get more Columbia MBAs into the industry. And, you know, we really see that uptick. We see that, you know, paying dividends in, in really all industries, quite frankly. Um, and so it, it's that sense of community that you build while you're on campus that then extends, you know, for the duration of, of your alumni tenure. And look, you know, it's Columbia for life. And so it's not only access to career resources for life it's it's access to that network for life and and it will always pay it forward for you um and it is your obligation as as an alum you know michael and i are both one of the you know too proud of the fifty thousand worldwide alumni it's your obligation as alum to pay it forward as well to to incoming students and we all we all know it we all live it we all love it you've given example Michael of individuals uh, you know that are transforming the fortune 500 but also their local neighborhoods and, and yes, communities yes. so perhaps my, my question to you you know 20 years into the job and, and the care and the attention that you take to, to look at the candidates and their individuals still loving what you do yes <laughs> yes because um well, I'm a, I'm a parent, right? So, so yeah, I think we're all parents on, on, on this call. Um, but, but that's the response I, I, that I'll take. Where, like, when something is hard, and you're a young person figures it out, and they're crying, or whatever, and they're you know, and and they're struggling, and then they kind of figure that out. Like, you get to kind of see this with like so many people. Um, and like so, so for me, it's, it's almost like a parental kind of feeling for for me. That this is is not just a job for me. Um, sometimes I felt it's it's more like a a, a calling. Um, and the, the last thing I, I, I'll say on that point, um, there, there's a, a lot of young people on the call, but there's a famous film called The Matrix, um, and Morbius says, says to Neo, you know, like when Neo kind of figures things out, like he's beginning to believe. Right, and 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 that's the line that always resonates with with, with me when when you see that belief where that young person really starts to believe in their ability, um, and they start executing, and it, like a light goes off, like that gives me like so I just I just love seeing that, and and I keep on seeing it every year. So like I that that's the best thing for me. Well, it's a fantastic family and in this wonderful new home, we hope that uh, as, as travel restrictions lift, people will be able to come and 
uh, discover Manhattanville, as you said, um, Yoris Hall will be fondly remembered, but uh, Manhattanville is very much looking towards the future. Um, wow, I, I didn't see the time just go by. Uh, and I think that speaks to uh, the energy and, and just the passion that you bring uh, to, to your work. Uh, Tricia, Michael, it, it's lovely to have you with us to, to see you both continued safe travels and as you then get back home. But thanks for joining us at Centre Court. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.